Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. Here let's look at how to take a square grid and convert it into a hex grid. We want to change the shape of the grid and also be able to identify what grid position belongs to a certain world position. So a while ago I launched my turn-based strategy course. It's a really awesome course that will help you take your skills from beginner to advanced. The reviews have been extremely positive, so I'm really happy with how it came out. Throughout the whole course I'm constantly talking about writing good clean code and focus on keeping a good code architecture. Because of that, the final set of the course is very adaptable and easily expandable. So in the last lecture I asked what would people like to see in future free updates, and the most common request is hex grid, so that's what I've been researching. Now if you just want a simple math answer to test if a certain point is inside a hex, I already covered that in a separate video. That one is focused solely on the math for doing that test. It's really great and I definitely encourage you to watch that video, especially if you're not a math expert, just like I'm not. Learning how to do that is relatively simple and will help you boost your math skills. The goal in this video is a hex grid, which doesn't actually require that logic for testing a point, it's mostly just a distance check. Like I said, I'm hard at work on the free expansion for the course, making hex grids work with the entire rest of that project, but since this is such a requested and useful topic, I figured I'd also make a standalone video based on the grid system that I've built over many videos on this channel. And for this topic, it's actually surprisingly difficult to find some good info on it. If you search for Unity Hex, you will only find two things. Tutorials making visual hexes, either mesh-based or with a tile map, and tutorials on making hex logic, but based on using mesh objects and doing some expensive raycasts. Those tutorials are great if that's exactly what you're looking for, but while that approach does work, it's not scalable. If you create an object with a mesh and a physics collider, you will very quickly reach the limits of that method, so you won't be able to make a game with a massive grin. So over here, let's do it properly with some basic math. Now, before we get to the code, let's do a quick overview of what we're trying to build here. Over here is a simple image of a basic square grid. So all the positions are placed neatly in a simple square shape. Each grid position has a certain cell size for both the width and the height. Now over here is the hex grid that we want to build. The main difference between them is this offset on the X for each odd row. So row zero starts off here, which would be on same thing like zero zero. However, for row one, we need to offset it by a little bit and the offset position is going to be half the cell size. And the other very important thing is the Z or the Y position. By the way, all the logic here works exactly the same in 3D or 2D, meaning it's exactly the same in XY or an XZ plane, so all the code can easily be converted into either X-based or Y-based. So like I said, over here the only difference is the Y offset. On a square grid, each row is exactly one cell size above the previous one. However, over here on the X grid, the Y offset for over here the first row is not exactly the cell size. If we were to offset upwards by the cell size, then instead of being positioned in here, it would actually be positioned in here. And if we used half cell size, then we would end up here, so it's neither of those. In order for this to be offset perfectly, the offset has to be 75% the size. So that is half the cell size plus a quarter of the cell size, or 0.75 of the size. Now these numbers are extremely important to get right in order to make sure that our hex grid matches perfectly. With that, we're going to be able to position all of our hex grid positions. Then we need to incorporate that into our coordinate conversion logic, meaning converting to and from grid positions to world positions. So in order to convert from a grid to a world position, that one is pretty simple. We take the xy grid position, like for example over here, grid position 1, 0. We take that one and we just multiply by the cell size. So in this case, if we got a cell size of 10, then position 1, 0 would be in world position 10, 0. And then on top of that, we also need to test if it's an odd or even row. So if it is an odd row, like for example we're testing for 0, 1, then we do the same basic math, so in this case this would be worm position 0, 10, but then we check if this is an odd row, if so then we add an x offset, and that x offset is going to be by half the cell size. So converting grid positions to worm positions is actually pretty simple. The tricky part is on the worm position to grid position. For that, when we receive a worm position, we need to test which grid position that it belongs to. Now with a square grid, that is pretty simple. We can just round the position and it works, so a position over here is going to round to here, a position down here rounds to there, so all of it works. However, on a hex grid, just rounding does not work. For example here, if we are above this line and we test a point in here, just rounding it will likely give us this point here, which would obviously not be correct. So for this to work, we first round the point to get a rough closest grid position, so let's say rounding would round into this one. Then we take that node and we grab all six of its neighbors, so the one to the left, left down, this one, this one, this one, and this one. We grab all six neighbors of the rounded grid position. Then we cycle through all of them and we do a simple distance check to the origin. So check distance to this one, this one, this one, this one, and we would find out that this one is indeed the closest. 
With that logic, we can indeed convert a worm position into the closest accurate grid position. Okay, so that's everything we need to build, so let's do it. If you use Unity in any way, definitely get my Ultimate Unity Overview course. It will teach you how to use the many tools and features that Unity has so you can be more effective and make better games faster. There's no need to build something yourself from scratch if there's already a built-in tool that works great. Unity has tons of them that you might not know about. The course already has 15 lectures, each covering a different tool or feature of the engine, and is constantly getting free updates. Or if you prefer step-by-step -step courses on making a specific game, check out my Builder Defender course. I also have a full course only on using visual scripting. There isn't a single line of code in any of those games. And if you're past the beginner stage and you want a guided path to help you make the jump from beginner to advanced, then get my turn-based strategy course. It will help you massively improve your programming and game dev skills. On all courses, I'm always available in the Q&A section, answering all of your questions every single day. So check them out with the link in the description. Okay, so let's implement the design for our hex grid system. Like I said, this is going to be based on my grid system, which I've built over several videos on the channel. Over here, I have my grid class working. So I got a grid with a certain width and height, and as you can see, it has a simple square shape. Now the goal is to convert this shape into a hex shape. So here is the code creating that grid. All I do is define a certain width, certain height, and a certain cell size. Then just create a grid using my grid class. Give it the width, height, the cell size, position on vector3.0. Then just cycle through the entire thing and just instantiate a prefab on each grid position. Again, if you don't understand this code, go watch the other videos on the grid system. This system was built from scratch starting from the very first video. Now the first thing we're going to do is handle the conversion from grid position to world position. First we want to do that so we can generate the correct world position so we can position all of our visuals. But before we do that, let's actually duplicate this class. I don't want to destroy my square grid system, that one is still useful. So here on my grid system, just going to duplicate this and call this the grid hex xz. Then inside the script, just need to change all of these references, so grid hex xz just in there, over here on the constructor, on the func, and I think that's it. Okay, great, so this is script. And on the testing script, just change the class name, so from that one into that one, so just replace all these, and let's also rename this variable to grid hex xz. Let's test, just to make sure nothing breaks. And yep, we still have a square grid. Okay, so far so good. Now here in the editor, I'm going to swap out the visual, so I'm using this one, which has just a basic square, and I'm going to swap it out for this one, which has a hex sprite. I drew this perfect hex in Photoshop. Photoshop actually has a great tool for making perfect hex shapes. I mentioned that in the previous hex video. Or you can also download the project files for this video, and the sprite will be included. So over here, just swapped out the prefab, and let's run. And yep, it is indeed spawning the hex visual, but obviously it does not look correct. We can see that we have a gap in here because we are placing this hex still in here when it should be offset and slightly lower. So let's first implement the offsetting of odd rows. Let's go over here into the grid hex xz script and let's scroll down to find the function. So here it is, the one to get a world position. So it takes in an x and a z and returns a world space vector 3. Again, we can refer back here to our diagram. So if it is odd, then we want to offset it by half the cell size. So over here we're going to return this position, so we get that multiplied by the cell size plus the origin position in the end, and then plus, let's test if it is an odd position. How we test it is super simple, we can do a modulo of 2. So if this one is 1, then we do know this is an odd row. By the way, if you don't know the modulo operator, this is the modulo in math, so it's basically the remainder of the division. So that's how we can tell if this is an odd row or an even row, so if it is an odd row, then we're going to add our offset, and like we saw, the offset is on the x, so let's put 1, 0, 0, and the offset amount is going to be by half the cell size, so cell size times 0.5f. And if it is not an odd row, then we don't want to add an offset, so let's use vector3.0. Okay, so that's it, and just with this, let's see if the offset is already working correctly. And yep, it is indeed working. So the even rows are still placed exactly where they were, but the odd ones are now offset. Okay, so that's good. But of course, there's still the issue that I mentioned before. For the square grid, we do offset it on the z by the size, same as the width. But on the hex grid, we need to offset on the z by half the size plus a quarter of the size. So in total, 0.75 the size. So again, here in our conversion, for the x, we're going to move by the cell size, that is correct. But then for the z, so new vector 3, offset this time on the z. For this one, we're not going to offset just by the cell size, but 0.75f of the cell size. 
And actually this number here, 0.75, this will be used in several parts of our hex logic. And as always, we never want to use mysterious magic numbers. Like this, if you were to return to this code after some time, you would have no idea what this 0.75 represents. So let's go up here and make a proper constant with a proper name. Let's call it hex vertical offset multiplier. And we put it at 0.75f. Okay, so now we use this. So let's go down here instead of this magic number. Let's use our constant. Okay, great. Just with this, let's test. And yep, it's working. Okay, great. All right, so with this, the easy part is done. We have successfully managed to convert grid positions into worm positions. All right, awesome. Now let's go into the more complex part, converting a worm position back into a grid position. For a nice visual, just so we're able to see what the logic is doing, over here on my hex prefab, I've got the standard hex sprite. Then I've got another one, also a hex sprite, except this one is going green. Basically we want to show or hide this game object so we're able to see which grid position the conversion process is actually selecting. So over here on the testing script, let's just add some visuals to our grid object. Then just a basic show and hide function. Okay, it just finds the selected game object and sets it to active or not. Again, we're doing this just so we have some nice debug visuals. So over here then we need to assign it. So we instantiated, we grab the reference, then we go into the grid object on this position and we assign the visual transform and tell it to hide itself. Then let's show the selected for the one underneath the mouse position. So let's do a private void update. And on update, let's get the mouse worm position. Now, if you don't know how to do that, check out my quick video tutorial on it. In there, I made this function so I can use it here. So get the mouse worm position. Then I go into the grid hex and I get the grid object on this mouse worm position. I tell this one to show and now I just need to hide the previous one. So I just need to get that one. So private for the grid object, the last grid object. Okay, with that, then now over here, if it is not known, then we tell it to hide and then we tell it to show. Okay, that's it. So with this, we should be able to have a nice visual, which is going to be very helpful as we try to handle our world to grid position logic. Let's see. And yep, it is working. So as I move the mouse, I am selecting the underlying hex grid position. Okay. Now, obviously, as you can see, the logic is not working. So the mouse is over here and it's selecting down, down there. So it is not correct. The logic is still based on rounding, which works for a square grid, but obviously does not work for a hex grid. So going back to the implementation overview I covered in the beginning, for this to work, like I said, we need to round the position and grab the rough X and rough Z. Then we take that grid position and we grab all six of its neighbors. With that, we test the distance to each of them. And when doing that, we're going to be able to find which one is the actual closest neighbor, which will be the closest hex position. So when we do the first rounding, that is just the rough X and rough Z and not the final one. So over here on the function to get the XZ, which by the way, just in case you haven't seen the other grid system videos, when we call grid grid object, when we call this, this one is then calling the get XZ. So in the end, we end up going through this function. Okay, so this one is just flooring the values. Now this is not going to be the final values, it's just going to be the rough one, and let's actually round set of floor. So let's grab an int for the rough x, and we're going to round this one. And this is going to be an int for the rough z, and again, let's also round it. So we have the two rough values. Now let's make a list for all of the neighbors that we want to test. So let's say a list of vector three int neighbor xz list. And now here an extremely important thing is you have to remember that the hex grid has an offset. So back to our diagram here, if we are testing something over here and we round out to this position, 2, 2, if we go into this one, then we can see that the first ones we want to test are the left and right neighbors. So just minus one on the x and plus one on the x. So let's do minus one on the x. And we're going to do a vector three int of the rough xz. And 
Then here we add the rough XZ to this offset. Okay, so we've got the left one. Then the right one is going to be plus one. Okay. And now here comes the tricky part, which is for the ones above and below. For these ones, if we go minus one on the X, yep, we do get this one. But then if we try going plus one on the X, then instead of getting this one, we end up with this one. That is not what we want. We want the six neighbors, so in this case it would be minus one and plus zero. However, that also depends if we have an even row or an odd row. For the odd row, as we can see, we want minus one on the X and plus zero. However, when working with an odd row, for that one we want plus zero and plus one. If we do minus one and plus zero, then we end up getting these two and not these two. So again, this is the tricky part. Definitely make sure you get the offsets correct. If you make a mistake, you might see issues because you won't be testing the exact six closest neighbors. So over here, and let's grab that neighbor. So let's first put all of them. So on a plus one, we test the minus one and the plus zero. And then the two neighbors below. So it's minus one on the Z. Then differences on this one, it will be either minus one or plus one, depending on if it's an odd or even row. So let's define here a bool, call it odd row, and we grab the rough Z. And again, doing the same thing, modulo of two. So if then equals one, if so, then this one is an odd row. Then over here, if this one is an odd row, if it is odd, then we want plus one. And if it is not, then we want minus one. And same thing on this one. All right, so this should be working. Again, be very careful, make sure you don't get the neighbors wrong. Let's do a quick test, just make sure this is all working correctly. Let's print out all the neighbors. Okay, so here just add a simple log, let's see. All right, so I put the mouse over there on position 22, so we can see down here, so we are testing position 22, all right. And the neighbor is going to be 12, which is the one to the left, 32, which is the one to the right, all right. Then we have 13, so 3 is going to be the row above, and 1 is going to be to the left, so it's going to be this one. Then 23 is going to be this one, and then down below we have 11 and 21. So it works on the even rows, now let's put the mouse position over here. So with this one, it is now positioned on 1, 1. So this is 0, 0, 1, 0, and over here we have 1, 1. Okay, that is correct. Then we're testing left and right, so 0 and 2, so 0, 1, 2, 1. Yep, correct. And then we test 2, 2, and 1, 2. So row 2 is going to be this one, so this one is 0, and we're going to test 1 and 2, so yep, that is correct. And then down here on row 0, we also test 1 and 2. Yep, also correct. All right, so we're correctly grabbing all of our neighbors. Now after this, the code is going to be super simple, so we just cycle through all the neighbors, yep. And then we're just going to do a basic distance check to find the closest. Alright, so here it is, just some basic closest logic. So we cycle through all of the neighbors, then we test the distance from the worm position that we're trying to test. We test from that one to the worm position of this neighbor. So if that distance is closer than the one that was previously closest, then this one becomes the new closest. So we cycle through all of the neighbors and then we return it. Okay, so that's really all the logic. As you can see, it's all super simple. The only tricky part, just over here the neighbors, but as long as you make that correctly, other than that, it's just a simple distance check. Also, one thing that I forgot a while ago, over here when calculating the rough values for the rough or the z, we also need to incorporate the hex vertical offset multiplier. So over here, we also need to divide by this one. If we don't do that, then with a bigger and bigger grid, then the rough z would become more and more inaccurate, so it wouldn't actually work. So let's test. And up here, we can already verify that it is indeed working. So if my mouse is over there, if I go anywhere inside this hexagon, yep, I'm inside. And if I go outside, yep, I'm on this one. So it works on an odd row, and if I go here, yep, it works on an even row. So wherever I place my mouse position, I can go to the edge, go to zero, zero, to there, and all of them, it's always perfect which one is selected underneath the mouse position. So it works if we test on the horizontal sides, so over there it swaps, over there it swaps, it works on diagonals, that one, that one, that one, and that one. And it also works on a really massive grid. So here I am, regardless of what size it is, I always know which grid position is under the mouse position. Always, always perfect. Whether I go into the corners, into the sides, to the edges, all of it works perfectly. All right, awesome. Now at this point, I should point out that obviously you can massively improve the performance of this system. Over here, we are generating a ton of garbage by generating the neighbor list every single time. So you could probably cache these neighbors in some way to avoid all of this. 
then perhaps instead of checking the distance against every single neighbor, you could add some basic checks to limit how many neighbors you test. So there's plenty of ways to make this more performant. And then of course for the visuals over here, just to keep it simple, I instantiate a new game object for each grid position. However, obviously that is not very scalable. So instead a much better approach would be using the tile map that I covered in a previous video. That one is based on dynamically generating a mesh and attaching it to the underlying grid system just like this one. So with that, instead of having one game object per each grid position, you would have just one game object for the entire grid. That would be much, much more performant. So you can watch that video to learn how to do that, or you can just watch my video on how to dynamically generate the mesh through code. That is really all you need to make this a lot more performant. All right, so now you know how to make a hex grid system. If you want a fun challenge, go watch my grid system videos and convert one of those systems to this hex grid system. For example, the grid building system, that would be a fun one to convert. And also I want to apply this to the ASAR pathfinding that I covered previously. Since that one uses this same underlying grid system, it should be pretty easy to convert. And of course, like I mentioned in the beginning, the reason why I researched this topic is because people ask for it in my turn-based strategy course. I'm hard at work on the free expansion of the course, heading hex logic to that entire game. If you haven't picked up the course, definitely go ahead and give it a look. I worked really hard on making it an excellent course, specifically to help guide you and take your skills from beginner to advanced. So if you're interested in turn-based strategy games, or really you just want to improve your programming and game dev skills while learning how to write good clean code, then check it out. And if you already have it, then this hex grid update will be a commonly free expansion to the course, hopefully within the next few weeks. Alright, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.